This is the I'm Possible Project show, where we interview real people who have achieved incredible feats in the face of overwhelming odds, showing that impossible is just a state of mind and that anything is possible. I'm your host, Joshua Rivetall. Today, in episode 32, Real Men Talk About Their Feelings, I talk to Al Levin. Let's jump right in. Al is actually a new friend of mine. We met because we're both sort of in this male depression space. We both have have lived with that and learned to manage that. Al's also an assistant principal in a public elementary school. He's been in education for nearly 20 years. He's married. He has four young children between the ages of 10 and 4. I hope that's still up to date. His wife's an educator, but she resigned from a teaching position when he had, when they had twins. And... Al's, I've had a chance to chat with Al several times, and he's a really good dude, and I'm really excited to have you on the show, Al. Thanks, man, for joining me, joining us on the show today. I'm really excited uh, to be on your show. Thank you for having me, Jess. Well, brother, it's my pleasure. So, Al, man, you're like, you're more than just the assistant principal and the guy with depression and the dude with twins. You've got a lot going on. You're, you're, you're a whole person, right? So I, I'm curious, and I know our listeners will be as well. Can you give us a little more of a background on your life, where you've been, where you, where you're going, the Al Levin experience, please and thank you. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, you nailed a lot of it with my bio. You did point out that it was quite up to date, but very close. My oldest kid is 12, and uh, you know, I'm sorry, actually, my oldest kid is 11. So my daughter is 11. She started middle school. I've got a nine-year-old daughter. And we have twins uh, that are six and just started kindergarten today, actually. So it was a big day. I grew up uh, in a suburb of Minneapolis, pretty close, tight family, one older brother, one older sister, and did my undergrad uh, at the UW Wisconsin, Madison, University of Wisconsin, Madison. Studied business, but my junior year, I ended up going to Japan and lived in Japan for a full year. Didn't know any Japanese. And the the deal with the program was I had to start studying Japanese when I went there, which was part of why I wanted to go overseas to learn another language. So then I uh, graduated from Madison and I went back to Japan just to work on the language. Really, that was my goal. And uh, ends up that I spent four years there, a year each time, a year in Japan, a year back home, a year in Japan, a year back home. And then I worked for a small business, a small Japanese company in Chicago for a year. And then I it was the start of my education path. I, I missed working with kids, and my mother was an educator. So then I decided to come back to the Twin Cities. I live in Minneapolis, and I entered a master's program for an initial license in teaching. So I became a licensed ESL, English as a Second Language teacher, and I'm licensed to teach Japanese. That's kind of uh, what got me into the education piece. That was my pathway. That's awesome, man. Really interesting. A lot of a lot of juice there, man. How did you, I'm, I'm kind of curious a little bit, just asking you about you, this Japanese thing, like, mm-hmm. like, how did that, where did that come from? Where did, are you like a Japanophile or? Yeah, it's, it's funny. A lot of people ask that question. In fact, Many people say, wow, four years, you must have loved Japan. And I always tell people I really, I have a love-hate relationship with Japan. Mm. Um, but for me, I wanted to go overseas my junior year. I didn't really have a language that I could hang my hat on other than a little bit of high school German, but nothing that I really even remembered by the time I was a junior at college. Um, so I went to the travel center at Madison and just paged through many overseas programs to find something that was really different, but that did not require a language ahead of time. A lot of programs say you need to have studied for this particular language for two years before going to that country to study. And I didn't want to go to England or Australia, even though now I realize, I mean, that would be a cool experience and it is quite different than the U.S., but I just felt like I wanted to go somewhere really really different, and thought that dealing with the language barrier would be an interesting challenge and to study a language. So I finally found a program that said you don't have to know the language at all, but you do have to start studying it when you're there. So it was a pretty incredible experience. I lived, the school I went to is called Sophia University. The Japanese name is Jochi Daigaku. And I lit, there was an international campus where it was mostly foreign students. Um, and it was a 10 minute walk to the Japanese campus. And I actually lived on the Japanese campus where everything was taught in Japanese 
in a dormitory with 240 guys and about 40 of them were international folks, not from Japan. So I would get up every day and luckily living in to- the dead center of Tokyo, I was lucky that my commute was a 10 minute walk because I only took the subway once or twice probably in that year during rush hour. And the stories you hear are absolutely true. It is nuts. It's insane. There are workers there wearing uniforms and white gloves and they shove you onto the train and squish you in like you've never seen before. I mean, it is amazing how jam packed they are. The first time the doors opened, like there were wall to wall people all the way to the door and I was waiting for people to get out and nobody got out and people just start shoving in. It sounds like New York City, but to like the nth degree, like the worst <laughs> part of, of New York City. So is that is that part of the hate relationship that you got going on? You said, so, well, you said I've got this love hate yeah. relationship. So I'm yeah. kind of yeah. going back to that. So, yeah. So, you know, I wouldn't even consider that to be the love hate. Actually, the subway system and train system, I love because it is inc- it's incredibly clean. They're always on time. They're super reliable. And and it really promotes a ton of walking. Like, you can live in Tokyo easily without a car and walk to the nearest train station or subway because you know it's going to be a short uh, walk and take it, and then you walk to your final destination, and you can get some reading and stuff done on the on the subway or train. So I, I do enjoy that piece. I do not enjoy the rush hour piece, obviously. Um, that is pretty mm-hmm. wild. But there are interesting pieces about the culture, that I, some that I really love and some that I really hate. So there's one example I have that kind of goes both ways. There's a system called Senpai Kohai, and it really means inferior, superior. And it's the way the whole society runs, including the way you speak to people. So when younger guys in the dormitory would enter the bathroom, if they were freshmen, they would be they would bow to anybody in the bathroom. They just bow before they enter and they shout, like, excuse me. Um, and then when they leave, they turn around, face everybody, they bow again, and they say, you know, excuse me for I've rude and disrupted you, essentially would be the translation. So in a lot of ways, that system of Senpai Kohai is really cool. Like the freshmen, the graduate come back and help the younger, the, the soon-to-graduate guys look for work and get jobs, and they help mentor them. And in other ways, the system is, is fairly abusive. You know, like if you're on the football team and you drop a pass and you're one of the younger guys, expect to get punched in the gut. You're going to be in trouble for that. Or if you don't uh-huh. greet somebody properly in the dormitory when you're the young guy addressing the older guy and you don't use the more formal language that you should be using, You'll get teed up for that. During Hanami, Hanami is in April. It's the cherry blossoms. And Japan is well known for the cherry blossom viewing when everybody goes out to see the cherry blossoms and they sit underneath it, have picnics, and drink a lot of sake or sake. And Mm -hmm. the younger guys, though, are forced, especially at the college level, they are forced to drink. And they cannot say, whoa, dude, I've had too much to drink. They just have to keep drinking. So, like, the freshman beds were lined with newspapers during a big event. And I was told, don't go into the dormitory because it's going to smell like puke. Um, and oh, each year, you know, some some guys end up dying from alcohol poisoning, essentially, because they can't say, you know what, I've had enough and need to stop. <laughs> but I don't mean to be bash Japan because there are lots of amazing things and a lot of amazing people, beautiful Japanese people there who are super kind and lots of cool, cool, traditional things there as well. This sounds like a, a just a hell of an experience. You know, I want to go back to your bio for a second because there was something in there, and I'm wondering, how, you know, if, if it played a factor in this Japanese experience or beyond. I mean, it could be anything. You know, I've had no expectations. But you, in your bio, you talk about this depressive disorder that you have and that you've that that had you down for the count for a little while. Did that manifest itself at all while you were there? Because you're away from home. You're a, you're you're a junior a junior in college and yeah. beyond, right? And so that's an interest. I mean, people have a hard enough time transitioning from high school to college, college to the workplace, whatever. Those yeah. those transitions are very difficult for a lot of people. I, I work in colleges on campuses quite often, so I, I, I get a chance to hear about that and see that. And so I'm, I guess I'm curious as to when did this start? I mean, when did you kind of have this idea or, or, or when was it diagnosed? And was it manifesting itself as you look back through that time period or, or, or even prior? 
Yeah, so that's a great question because you're right. There's absolutely, you know, there's culture shock involved in going overseas, right? And what's really interesting is that there is culture shock when you go to another country. If you're there long enough, when you come home, it's called reverse culture shock. And that is actually oftentimes much more impactful than the culture shock. And the reason is when you go to Japan, you expect everything to be different. And it is. Sure, you get homesick and stuff, but... When you come home, like you're expecting everything to be the same and you understand everything. And for example, I rode on the subways and trains every day in Japan without speaking the language. And I came home and got lost in Chicago on the trains. And all of a sudden the train stopped and I was at the wrong place and didn't know where I was and got fairly scared. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it's like, oh my God, I can't even get around in Chicago. Or people start talking about things that you don't understand at all. You know, when I left, um, friends became a huge show. And when I got back and people were talking about TV shows like that, that I had no idea what they were. And they look at you like, wow, what's up with you? Or a great example is I I tried to light a cigarette for a buddy of mine and didn't realize that while I was gone, they had implemented safeties on lighter, which, uh, you know, both of those examples give a good example of how old I am. But um, so (laughs) I didn't know there was a safety on the lighter. And and the guy looked at me and he was like, there's a safety, you dumbass. And I was like, whoa, all right, sorry. (laughs) But, you know, so things are different. But I would say for the most part, other than some homesickness and stuff, And, you know, there was not Skype, there was not easy communication back and forth at that time, but I did not really experience it. I've always been kind of anxious as a kid and growing up, but I don't think it ever really stood out to me. And the the first time that I hit a major depression was not until it was 2010, so not that long ago. And I had been promoted in my school district from an assistant principal to a principal. So I was in a new role. Unfortunately, I can't say that I felt 100% supported by the people above me at the district level. And I came into a challenging situation where I was in a budget deficit and they were expecting me to essentially fire people immediately. And there were many other challenges and I didn't know anybody in the building or anything. And then in addition to that, at home, I had a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and two newborns at the time. So, you know, and I've read since then about what they call stress pileup or stress buildup. And I think, you know, that was the first time I started to really experience major depression or any kind of depression. It had never been a part of my life until then. And now I'm 47. So, you know, I was right around 40 or so. And I think a lot of folks experience depression at a younger age than that. But for me, it was definitely not until then I started, you know, I wasn't really sure what to do. I wasn't sleeping at night. I started losing weight because I wasn't eating because of knots in my stomach. And I ended up going one day to my family doctor and it was so strange. It seemed so surreal. I was in his office and I was pacing back and forth and I could not stop. I couldn't sit down. And my doctor who knew me just from being my doctor for many years said, whoa, Al, like, what's going on? This isn't like you. And I I shared with him my story, the stresses at work, the stress of being in a new position, the stressors at home. And he was like, you know, this is depression. And he started me on a medication and I started seeing a therapist. And I was able to, you know, work through that depression, which felt like fairly quick for me. And my wife might disagree, but I felt like it was, you know, a couple of months. I never had to really leave work, but it was challenging and difficult. And, but I did work work my way through it. And then my, after two years in that role and, you know, my second year feeling much better, but after two years, I realized I almost never saw my kids that were so young. I was up and out of the house before they were awake and I'd get home always after dinner and many times after bedtime. So I literally wouldn't see them at all for long stretches of time. So after two years, I asked the district if I could step down and be an assistant principal again. And so after I was an assistant principal for one year, then my second year back as an assistant principal, which was in 2015, almost three years to the day from my first major depression, I went through another major depression. And that one, I don't really know why. I had a new principal in September, August really, had a great first review 
got along great with him. We were getting along great, like, you know, even like socially, just being able to, you know, hang out after work for, you know, a coffee or whatever. And at work, it was going well. I had a great review. And then in October, I just, I crashed hard. And I found myself, like one big event I remember was going to my wife's friend's place for Thanksgiving with our kids and they didn't have kids, but the two of them. And I just sat at the kitchen counter island and sat there. Essentially, it was like I was watching all these interactions around me, watching the kids play, watching their dogs, watching my wife talk with them. And I, I couldn't communicate. And again, I started not being able to eat. I lost like 40 to 50 pounds because I literally couldn't put food down my mouth. Um, I couldn't sleep at night. I was sleeping very, very little, maybe eight to 10 hours a week, it felt like, and just running on adrenaline. And my wife and I talked and said to my boss and said, you know, if I'm like this at home, like, what's work like? And we didn't want me to try to continue to mask it and fail at work and not have anybody know why. And I decided to call my boss and ask him to meet before work one day. We met in a coffee shop. And I shared with him what was going on, and he was fantastic. He said, you know what? Go home, take time you need, and uh, what you need, and, and get better, and then and keep me posted. And his first deal, right when I left the coffee shop, he called home to my wife, you know, and we had only known each other two or three months at this point, but he called my wife and said, hey, want you to know I just met with Al at the coffee shop. He told me what was going on, and he is on his way home. Just wanted you to know that so that, you know, he gets home safely. So I took 10 days off of work, which I would say was unstructured. I had no plans. I thought I'd take a new medicine and I'd get better working with a psychiatrist. It didn't, I didn't get much better, but I couldn't do anything during those 10 days. I would would tell my wife, hey, my therapist said it's like a brain injury and I need to nap. I would go upstairs in my bedroom, close the door, try to nap. And just, I would roll around for like three hours and I'd have intense crying bouts every night that I couldn't control and couldn't stop. And I just, I didn't feel myself at all. Um, I made little lists of what I would do each day while I was home those 10 days, like one load of laundry, clean a bathroom, and I couldn't do any of it. So I ended up going uh, back to work kind of between the Thanksgiving and winter break time thinking, okay, this will be a little test period and I'll do great and wasn't getting better at all and started having some general thoughts of suicide, which I hadn't had before. Just general thoughts of which I you know, wasn't here, be so much easier to not be here, this is too difficult, feeling really like not a good administrator, not a good father, not a good husband. And uh, when I started having the suicidal thoughts, I decided to go back to my therapist, uh, the psychiatrist, and tell him, you know, I said, I remember very clearly saying, I'm having suicidal thoughts. Could this be the medicine or could this be my depression? Because as paradoxical as it is, many antidepressants have warnings on them that they can cause suicidal ideation. And his response was, yes, it could be the medication, could be the depression. And he raised my dosage and I couldn't get the thoughts out of my head. It was just the wildest thing. It was continual throughout the day. No matter what was going on, those thoughts were shooting off in my head. And eventually one night, I dreamt about the plan. And I certainly had the means to go through with it. I had it all planned out, and it scared the hell out of me. So I went, I brought my wife and my sister back to the psychiatrist again so that I could have some more support to say, I need more help. And uh, we essentially talked him into giving me a letter, and I took three weeks off of work and checked myself into a partial hospitalization program, um, which was a great kickstart to getting better. gave me structure, gave me less stress of work, and it certainly doesn't cure a major depression like that. Nothing in three weeks is going to cure that, but it certainly, like I said, was a a great kickstart. So that, uh, that is my depression story. Yeah, man, it's and it's a hell of a story. Wow, I'm so glad you're here. And quite a jump from Japan to depression. I thought I was slicking to be able to tie that in. Yeah. But so the major depression, yeah, because my first question was initially going to be, it was a situational or was it the major clinical? Uh, I almost, It almost, to me, sounds a little bit like both. 
first one was definitely, in my mind, situational, right? Like new position, new responsibility, overwhelming responsibility, a lot of self-doubt of, you know, can I do this? And am I going to be good at it? And you know, I went into it essentially thinking, what do I do if it doesn't work? Which is not the attitude you want going into a role like that. Um, but I felt like that was situational. Um, but the second one is still kind of mind boggling to me. Cause like I said, I think a lot was going well in my life. I, it just seemed to me to almost come out of nowhere. I remember telling my brother and my best friend, I'm like, I do not feel good right now. Something is different in my body and it's not going to be good. I mean, I knew it was coming on yet. I couldn't stop it. That second one. Support is really interesting to me. I mean, and because you, you had this sort of self-doubt, I'm not a good father and a husband and all that stuff. And, and as someone who lives with clinical depression, major depression, I've been there, you know, and I just, I guess the comment, first I want to make a comment and say, anyone listening out there, that stuff is far from the truth. You know, we, we tell ourselves that because men aren't supposed to be sick. Men aren't supposed to be show any sort of cracks or weaknesses, if that's even possible, right? And sometimes I tear up thinking about it because there's so many guys in the world, men in the world, who are suffering in silence. And the people, you know, let's say the grandfather, the great-grandfather, well, in my day, this and that, if we did this and we did that and we didn't talk. I'm like, how did that work out for you? You seem pretty miserable, sir. You know, so like this sort of new age... You know, I mean, in sort of this new age, yeah. like masculinity, like we need to embrace that. Right. And and that's why we're having this conversation on top of that. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think you're right. I think a lot of men end up masking it. And, you know, there's a, a large stigma out there. Men are supposed to be strong. Men aren't supposed to talk about emotion. Um, I've read that the average person with depression waits 10 years before they go in for support. Um, and yeah, it's, that is that is why we're talking, right? Make sure people know it's okay to talk, it's okay to get help, and you don't have to suffer on your own alone. No way. I want to go back to your family for a second, your kids, your wife. How have they been through all this, you know, support-wise, as being, you know, they're, they're, they're your family. They're your, you know, they're intrinsically supposed to be your support system. It doesn't always happen. So I yeah. guess we might get to a gripe fest or we might just talk real, you know. I don't know. Yeah. Go for it. So my kids were so young at the time that I really just hid it from them. Even when I took three weeks off, I hid it from them. I was able to, you know, that was essentially like going to work. Partial hospitalization program was nine to three. So it was essentially like my hours changed slightly and I didn't have to share with them. Again, they were five, three and two newborns, essentially. Well, that's not true. The three years later, they were eight, five and um, two, eight, five, two, and two. But I never shared with them. I, I do want to share with them. And I did have shared with my 11-year-old now. Just over this last summer, I took her out for coffee and waffles. Well, the coffee shop. <laughs> and, uh, and I shared with her just about everything other than my suicidal thoughts. I didn't think she needed to hear that yet. And, uh, and I planned to share with my entire family. So I was essentially trying to mask it from the kids. My wife was really supportive. She struggled because she didn't know how to support me, um, and she did, but she was super supportive. I asked her to go with me to a few of my uh, talk therapy sessions so she could see what it was all like, and she could talk too, and she could ask about how she could support me. And so she was really as supportive as she could be. I think I you know, put her through the ringer. I, I think of things that I said to her that still shock me and I couldn't imagine being the one hearing it. And, you know, I would leave the house and she would wonder if I was going to come back home alive or she would leave and wonder what she was going to come home to. And so she went through lots of, you know, fear and not knowing how to support. So I'm sure feeling helpless. So once I finally got better, it's really interesting. Once I started on the path to recovery, like right when my partial hospitalization program ended, she came down with a horrible case of strep and like infections in her eyes. And she was like on the couch for like five days. 
And I think, you know, she had been holding us together for four to six months of my major depression, that second one, um, doing everything. And I think, like, finally her immune system just broke down once she realized I was getting better and she could kind of let loose. Um, and then I asked her to go to some talk therapy. I said, you know, I am sure you are going through some PTSD. You have to be from things I said to you and such. And she knew one of her good friends was seeing a therapist, so she got the name of someone, and she loved going to her. So I was really happy that she was willing to do that, too. I think it had helped that she had been to a couple of my therapy sessions, because she was actually like, hey, this is okay. This is kind of enjoyable. <laughs> so she had a good good view of therapy before I asked her to check into her own therapy. That's really cool. A couple of comments, just a lot of good stuff there. You know, one being, if anyone out there, and I've been there as well, if anyone out there is the lover, the carer, the support of the person living with mental illness who may be going through an episode or multiple episodes, it's so important that that you get help as well because you're going through so much as a carer, a lover, a supporter, and sometimes that role gets forgotten. And we don't talk about that as much, but it's so incredibly important because if if you do intend on continuing that role, you can't be your sharpest for that person if you're not your sharpest for yourself. So that that's one thing. And then this idea of you sharing with your children, I'm so yeah. grateful to hear that. My family, granddad took his life in the 60s, never talked about it, never talked about the fact that my aunt, my father's sister had bipolar disorder and that uh, I believe his, his mother had bipolar disorder as well. So I didn't really talk about that. I heard about my grandfather's suicide from my mother, who told me to keep it a secret when I was 12. And then this other stuff, the bipolar, the family history in my 20s. And so yeah. if, if I knew about that stuff much earlier, like your kids, or at least your 11-year-old at the moment, I would have been able to, to take a different path. I would have been able to kind of gone down the path of more self-awareness, pay attention to mental health, my mental health. And so really, really cool that you're doing that because we need to talk about this like we talk about diabetes and, and heart disease in our families. We're, we're so open about that, but we're not about mental illness and mental health. I mean, when we talk about our family histories, it's like, okay, diabetes, right? So, or, or, or even heart disease. Like you get a chance to, t you know, I, I'm just going to be extra cautious and I'm, I'm not going to eat all that bacon, you know, or whatever, or alcoholism. I'm not going to take that drink. But when we don't have the conversation, that child who will grow up doesn't have a choice. You're leaving them yeah. with very few options. So I'm, I'm applauding you from afar on that one. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I do think, you know, one, depression is a piece of me now. And it doesn't define me, but it is a part of me. And the other piece is definitely I want them to know that it's okay to talk about feelings. It's okay to go through this stuff and to know that we are here to support them. So I definitely want that awareness piece for them that you mentioned. For sure. Question about going forward. How are you managing on the daily? How are you living with this on the daily? How are you coping? What is your recipes change? My recipe changes all the time. I mean, it yeah. looks the same probably from month to month, but it slowly changes and morphs. And what are you doing right now? How does How is that working for you? So I am doing quite a bit just around my own mental health. You know, I try to get a good night of sleep, seven to eight hours. I don't always do that, but I always try. It's always on my mind. I'm trying to eat better. I try to exercise regularly. I definitely have my better periods and worse periods like I have in the past, but it's on my mind. I'm more mentally aware of different things that if they bring me down to know, okay, you know what? I better hit the elliptical for longer this time or make sure I'm doing it every day because I feel something coming on. Luckily for me, my depression isn't something that I have to daily manage. I still am taking one medication and uh, I do, like I said, pay attention to these other pieces. I've done some meditation in the past. I really am a strong believer about the meditation. I'd love to do more um, and mindfulness, like living in the present moment and not thinking and dwelling on the past, not worrying so much about the future. So I'm, I'm, getting better at those pieces as well. And then one huge piece that's become very therapeutic and helpful, helpful for me is just all the advocating I've been doing around mental health. And that started, so my last major depression was in 2013. And this just started about a year, almost a year and a half ago that I started really um, advocating around mental illness. And that has been become a huge passion of mine. And I would love to even eventually shift my career into it 
And so I'm out speaking for NAMI. I give National Alliance on Mental Illness. I give two different presentations. One is our anti-stigma talk and one is In Our Own Voice, it's called, where you go out and share your story with a cool facilitator. I also tweet and blog. And now I'm in the process of, as you know, creating a podcast where all I'm doing is interviewing men who have been through depression. And it's been um, an amazing trip for me already, mm-hmm. learning so much from from guys. And, you know, I do think male depression is different and there is a heavier stigma. I think there's a big stigma as it is, but I do think like we talked earlier, it's even heavier on men. So, you know, I'm doing the podcast uh, for a dual purpose, really. One, I want to bring awareness to those who know little about depression so that they can see just how debilitating um, depression really can be by hearing these stories. And I also want them to be stories, you know, that give hope in the end for what these guys are doing now and how accomplished they've been and worked through it. Um, so for those people, those men or women who are in the midst of a depression, you know, to, to get some hope. But that's been um, incredible. And actually, I was pushing my HR director. I work for a very large urban school district. And I asked uh, the HR director, human resources director last year, I said, you know, this is where my passion is. And I think I have a lot to offer the staff. And uh, about two weeks before this school year started for administrators, he said, how about you put together a presentation for the administrators? And I was like, I'm on it, man. Thank you for this Mm -hmm. opportunity. So just about a week or two ago, I gave um, a presentation where I stood up in front of my own colleagues, assistant principal, principals, assistant superintendents. It was about 120 to 140 administrators from our school district. And I stood up on a big stage with a microphone, shared much of my story, shared about symptoms of depression, shared about the importance of self-care and the care of others, including the staff we work with and talked a bit about destigmatizing mental illness. And I was really excited at the end. I mean, I think it was powerful. People came up to me, at least two administrators pulled me aside and said, you know what, you you just described exactly how I am right now with tears in their eyes and lots of emails and such. And I give the human resource director kudos for one, putting mental health in the forefront, and two, letting me, a person who he really doesn't know, giving me the opportunity to speak. And I'm hoping to do a lot more of that, and that's really where my passion is. And now, in fact, now, you know, almost two weeks later, one of my social workers in our school said, hey, I was just with a bunch of lead social workers, and they said their principals are all talking about your presentation now. And so that's Mm. great. That's what I want, right? Because it's about me, because it's a talk about mental illness, and it's a talk that we should have been having ages ago. So I'm kind of, you know, it's one thing I'm proud of to be able to have brought this conversation to the forefront. She also said, oh, my goodness, like we're on the slate for mental illness conversations in September. That never happens. So Mm -hmm. I feel like I've already, you know, made had an impact on many, many people in the district, and I hope to do more. And. I'm I'm so glad to hear that you've already had such visceral reaction because that doesn't always happen and it doesn't have anything to do with the quality of, of your speaking skills or one speaking skill. Sometimes it's just a very difficult conversation or the nature of, of whatever's, you know, the, the, the culture of, of whom you're speaking to. So yeah. good, 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 good. And, and I, that and was going to be one I of think- my... You know, a big thing, a big thing is just the connection you make, right? I think everybody in there made connections from what I talked about, whether it was directly with themselves, which I know struck at least a few in the room, or whether it was relatives or cousins or their neighbor. You know, there is so much depression out there and it is so masked, but many, many people have some kind of direct connection with depression. So you really touch home, you know, when you talk about it. Um, to a large crowd. Even, you know, I mentioned to you that I'm doing a a coaching certification program. I just finished my last class. There were only eight of us in the class, which was fantastic. But I shared a little bit about my depression story, just a very little. And like one person started crying and another person connected me with weight, connected with me later and said, I want to collaborate with stuff on you, uh, with you. I've had depression in the past. My daughter was hospitalized. And that was a small group of eight where I deeply connected with two people just by opening up the conversation around depression. So if you're speaking to large groups, there is a connection to so many people. So that is at least what I have found from my experience. That's awesome, man. Vulnerability begets vulnerability, I think, when when done properly and for the benefit 
uh, from your speaking to. And that was going to be one of my questions, too, kind of swinging backward for a second, like, what's going down in your district, man? Are, are you the guy? And you are the guy. That's cool, man. That's that's really, really cool. And very, I think, brave. And I, and I, I, yeah. I, I hate saying that when it comes to this stuff, because I hear it a lot. You know, I share my story all the time. I've been doing it for like seven years at this point, 250 some odd presentations, whatever. Right. So oh, I hear awesome. brave. Thanks, dude. Thanks, man. And I'm like, I'm not brave, you know, but I know there's some bravery to it. And I say brave because I've, I've been doing these staff trainings lately and uh, around mental health and suicide prevention, how to intervene with a student or whatever who may be suicidal and also talking about coping skills and the basics of mental health and all that stuff. Right. But the different, it depends on the climate of the school, right? So like sometimes teachers and staff are allowed to disclose to students if they're, if they're, you know, working with maybe a suicidal student or something in a mental health breakdown. Some, some places they're allowed to disclose either their mental illness or they might say like, I may have been, I've been hospitalized one time or whatever. Right. And that's cool. And then some districts, you know, even though they were cool enough and forward thinking enough to, to have someone come in to talk about this, I, I've had a couple principals say, no, you can't. Cause we, you know, it's working through this improv situation where I play like the teacher and then it's either a student or something like that. And so when I play the teacher, sometimes I'll disclose and they're like, you can't do that. I don't want anyone in my district, in my school to do that because I don't want to get a note from or a phone call saying like, is this teacher mentally capable of teaching my children? I'm like, damn, like that's, that's cold. I mean, it's tr- kind of true in some places like that might happen, but that's cold. That's the stigma. Um, and, yeah. I just, interviewed, I just interviewed somebody recently and he said when he was like 12 years old, he mentioned some thoughts of harm, maybe even some suicidal ideation to a small group with like a youth pastor. And this was many, many years ago. But the pastor, the youth pastor's response was, oh, don't ever show, share those thoughts with anybody. Those yourself, which we know nowadays. And, and, you know, I'm sure that was out of the kindness of his own heart. But nowadays, like, what? Like, we, we need kids to open up, right? We need them to know that there are trusted adults in the schools, that they can have these conversations. Yeah. And, and that's part of what I'm trying to do, too, as an administrator in the district, model that I can talk about it. And, and so can others. And we need to look yeah. out for each other and support one another. We're not immune to mental illness just because we're in education. Right. And I think I think it's good for students to see that vulnerability because on some level, there's got to be this idea of this guy's taking a risk. Maybe I can take a risk and maybe I can yeah. disclose, which you've already seen in your coaching class, you know, and you've seen right. in your district, yeah. man. It's, it's just, I'm so proud of you. And I say that with all sincerity and, and trueness, just, just where you've been and where you're going and where you come from. Well, Al, thank I you. I, I actually I, applaud and look up to you for all the presenting you've done and all the work around it that you have done. So, you know, I have a, thanks, a lot of admiration for you. Appreciate that. I'm trying to, trying to keep up the hustle for mental health. <laughs> so Al, I think this is a good moment to switch gears for a bit because, and here's why this, I, I like to do this little segment called the quick fire round because okay. on this show, we talk about depression, mental illness, social justice issues, the foster care system, you know, even things that are upstream that may tie into mental illness or suicide and awareness and prevention. Right. So I don't want people to put us in a box or put my guests in a box say, well, they're just the depression guy or the foster care guy or the assault. Girl. Right. Like, we're all these different people, right? So this is just a fun little segment where I'm going to ask some questions. There's no right or wrong answer. We're just going to have some fun. Are you cool with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm in. Let's do it. All right, man. Cool. All right. So, Al, what's your favorite word? My favorite word actually is a Japanese word is tokidoki because I think it sounds so cool and it means sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Tokidoki. I'm going I'm to have to remember that. That'll be the Japanese <laughs> word that I know. Okie dope. There you go. Sometimes. I learned, my wife's in Belgium right now. I learned today that's, or the other day, that stoodle means key because we were fumbling around trying to find a key for her. So, tokie doki, <laughs> stoodle. All right. Uh, cool, man. <laughs> so, what's your least favorite word then? Least favorite word? Um, I don't like the word hate. Mm. I try to get my kids to not use it. It's ugly. I hate the word hate. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. This is one I love. So if somebody decided to make a movie of your life, Al, the Al Levin story, who would play the title role? Who would be the title role? Who would play you? Who would play the title role? Oh, who would play me? I don't know. I mean, the first name that just comes to my mind is Bruce Willis. Ooh, I love it. 
you were told saying? I look like Bruce Willis once or twice, but I have to admit that was in Japan from a couple Japanese girls. Not normally what people say about me. I get the most obscure like celebrities in my head sometimes, and I was thinking like I don't know why Vern Troyer popped into my head. The the little guy who played Mini Me, the little person who played Mini Me. <laughs> yeah. Not that you look like that guy, but I was like that would be an interesting movie. And I, I felt that like I had funny. to verbalize that because <laughs> I'm weird. Actually, like that. Um, rather than who would play me, I, I was hoping you were going to ask who would direct the movie because I'd have Tarantino direct it. Yeah. Oh snap, dude, that's oh, yeah. that that would be awesome. And and oh. those two have paired up, right? Uh, Tarantino and. Bruce Willis, for sure. Yes. In oh, the one with, yes, that's the one I was thinking of. Uma Thurman and, yeah, the, the McRoyal with cheese. Yeah. <laughs> so, next question. Who or what, who or what, Al, is your spirit animal? My spirit animal? Like an animal that would have the same spirit as myself? I don't know. You know, it's kind of like, I feel like the spirit animal question, I mean, I ask it because I think it's kind of fun and funny and silly. And I mean, there is I'm going, deep kind of thick into it, but I'm going with a bald eagle. Give me a little insight on that. I think uh, bald eagles, one, they are so beautiful. Um, I love just the idea of flying and you see them, you know, by rivers and by lake. Um, and I've always thought being able to fly would be really cool. And, uh, you know, they represent the U.S. Indeed, true story. Ooh, okay, I just thought of a question that I've never asked before. Let's hear it. If you could choose one superpower, what would it be? Ooh, um, I think I think it would be, um, you know, to be incredibly, incredibly strong, and I would hopefully only use it for good purposes, like to rescue people um, who need to be saved, you know, like a car accident and a car is on top of somebody so that I could come in and lift the car off of them and save them. Yeah. I like that, man. Or you could pick the car up as a cat underneath, or you could pick up the, the house and you forgot your keys yeah. in the basement. You know, you not have to but fall I do, the way back in. I do have to say the, uh, the second top runner for that one, which might even be the first one would be able to fly. Cause like I said, mm. you know, the bald Eagle, the idea of flying, you know, if I was younger and more brave, I'd put on one of those fly suits, flying suits, and jump off of a cliff. But actually, oh, I know I don't yeah. have the best for that. So <laughs> I would never Neither. do that. But yeah, to be able to fly, man, I think just like flying over the mountains, flying, you just get to see the see the beauty of the world and nature from a whole different perspective. Um, so to be able to fly would be really cool. Yeah, so that beats yeah, that you, beats the strong man thing for sure. I want to fly. Okay. I got you. I got you. And you might you might have to uh, really kind of twist your way. So I'm metaphorically speaking, of course, but you might need to get your pilot's license or something. I mean, that might be something yeah. to do. I mean, I can I can yeah. see you doing that. Pilots, I actually went on a few demo flights um, in small Cessnas where you go up with a pilot and they're trying to you know convince you to take to take lessons. But it was a cool kind of. I went like three times because you pay twenty bucks and you get oh, this way right. cool flight. And they essentially, like, at least one of them, let me pretty much take over because they want you to be excited about this and stuff. And so they let me essentially do the entire takeoff and then a bunch wow. of the landing. So it was really, really a cool experience. And my uncle used to be a pilot, and he ended up having a open cockpit biplane at Stearman. And uh, I was his first passenger <laughs> in that. That was a blast, too. You're full of experiences, man. This is why I love this quick fire round thing because we just get a chance to know a little bit more about you. Really, man, that's that's amazing. So that's uh, that's kind of the end of the quick fire round and kind of winding down. Al, if if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to find out more about your speaking or your podcast or or want to get in touch or just give you a fist bump from afar to say thanks, what what would be the best way or a couple ways that people can get in touch with you? Uh, well, thank you for asking. Um, I think my blog would be the best place to start, which is just my full name, Al Levin, L-E-V, like Victor, I-N, without any spaces, and the number 18, again with no space, so allevin18.wordpress.com. And from there, there's, you know, a link, different tabs up top, like my whole blog, all my posts are there and there's information there. There's my um, podcast is there's a link to my podcast, my podcast. They'll be able to get to two different ways. One is through pod. Well, they can get there through the 
the WordPress that I just mentioned, the website, but also it'll be it's on iTunes already with a little bit of a teaser, and uh, so they could check it out there too. And I'm, I'm pretty man. sure. Oh, and I'm also I'm also on Twitter. My handle is at Al Levin eighteen. So they can certainly tweet to me, DM, direct message me. I would love to hear from people. Awesome, man. Um, I'll make sure to get those in the show notes. So you'll, they'll, we'll have some live active links on, on my site. Um, oh, that would be great. This, yeah, no, absolutely. And this was really great. Uh, this was really eye-opening and inspirational, just like a real honor and a, a real treat. And really nice to spend some time with you. Thanks for joining me, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, I appreciate it you um, inviting me on the show and uh, doing the good work you do. So thank you tons for having me. You've been listening to the I'm Possible Project show with Joshua Rivetall and guest Al Levin. I love sharing stories and how to turn impossible into I'm Possible. If you want more inspirational stories, our second and third books are available right now. Changing Minds, Breaking Stigma, Achieving the Impossible, as well as Lemonade Stand. Both contain powerful stories of overcoming tremendous odds. When life gives you lemons, squeeze, add sugar, and pick up a copy of the I'm Possible Project. That's IAMPossibleProject.com slash 2 slash T-W-O or IAMPossibleProject.com slash Lemonade. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're more than a community. You're part of the I'm Possible family. Until next time, sending you lots of love. 